So next up is Mike Burrow, new Alabama fan after <laughs> last week. But um, he's going to talk about Occam versus Hickam. All right. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for having us this morning. We're really excited to be here. So I'm going to talk about a case in neuro-ophthalmology. Um, when I was in med school, I had a, a, an attending who I just happened to rotate with several times over the course of uh, the couple years, our clinical years, and he, he loved to, anytime someone new came on that hadn't rotated him, with him before, he loved to somehow bait them into talking about, you know, Occam's razor and, and this thought of, you know, the simplest explanation, yada, yada. And he was really good at it, no matter what, what the diagnosis was at the time, he just would try and kind of, you know, do those, que those pimp questions over and over again until finally he said, well, you know, why do you want to, why do you want to keep everything in one button, you know, just spelling it out for him. And finally they'd say, well, it's, you know, Occam's razor, it's parsimony. And then that's when he'd, he'd He'd like dive in and grab him and be like, no, but have you ever heard of this Dr. Hickam? And, and I never had until he, but he, he loved doing it. And I'll never forget now because I probably went through this spiel six or seven times. So I think most of us are familiar with Occam, but maybe not so many of us are familiar with um, Dr. John Hickam and what, what's known as Hickam's dictum. Um, it's not quite so eloquent, but I think it's, I think it's um, equally as important to remember. And I, I, I hope I have a good case here that I'm going to kind of race through and, and something that will illustrate the fact that we do have to keep differential diagnosis broad, including multiple diagnoses, um, and that everything doesn't always fit into one nice little package. So, uh, so this starts back in 2012 as a 16-year-old female who is otherwise healthy, and she presented to the children's ED for whooshing in her ears, blurry vision, some neck pain, and dim outs. Um, that had occurred over the period of, se of several months, um, and she's found to have bilateral stage four optic disc edema, and then underwent subsequent imaging, as mentioned there. She did get a lumbar puncture, which showed a very high opening pressure of 50 uh, centimeters of water, and I, should, I tried to highlight the important things in red. I somehow missed, that. I should have been like in bold and flashing or something, but um, the only real other abnormal thing on her laboratory imaging workup was her LP also showed a white count of 25 with 96% lymphocytes. She had these other laboratory uh, investigations, as mentioned. She was started on Diamox and then sent to neuro-ophthalmology for evaluation. Uh, a little bit more about her HPI uh, that was kind of gathered while she was in neuro-ophthalmology clinic is this neck pain, the whooshing in the ears had been going on since February, so a couple months. Um, and then she did start developing blurred vision later on in that course with these dim outs that she would describe and it would happen most often, she would notice it when she was kind of transitioning from lying down to standing up. No other medical history, ocular history, and she wasn't on any other medications and had any changes in her medications recently. All right, and uh, no recent travel, exposure to pets, a lot of the things that we just kind of are, went over with Becca that are important to really investigate. And then the only other thing on review of symptoms, she had a recent URI and then she had some knee pain as well. Her exam uh, is noted here, actually a pretty uh, normal exam at this point. And then on, uh, dil or, yeah, on dilated exam, she did have some stage one disc edema, so it had improved since she'd been in the ED from a reportedly stage four bilaterally to stage one, which you can just see more nasally than temporally right there. And then, oh good, it actually shows up better than I was expecting. So she did have in her macula uh, more on the right eye than the left eye, but this presence of a uh, let's see macular star right here. So you can see it, it shows up a little bit better um, on hopefully this next screen. But and then a little bit of just some in the way of some hard exudates that you can see around the macula over here as well. So it shows up just a little bit better. As really usually things don't show up very well on the screen, but that is actually okay. So. She did have a Humphrey visual field, which showed enlar mild enlargement of both of her blind spots. And then so sub subsequent OCT studies showed um, ISOS disruption, more notable on the right eye with some small exudates, um, but also some involvement of the left eye as well that you can see, especially right here. So just a, a short differential, certainly not all encompassing, but later on I'll kind of talk about that. Um, you know, the thought was that she obviously had signs of elevated intracranial pressure, but she also had this abnormal uh, CSF study of the elevated white count, so you couldn't call it um, IIH. Uh, 
um, but really weren't sure of what the ideology could be. Um, she also had signs, the macular star pointing to a, a neuroretinitis, and then the CSF with elevated white count, but also unclear of what the ideology was. And um, also just something that was being heavily considered at that time was a, an optic neuritis. So I had a, a pretty good, we took a lot of blood from this girl and uh, sent it out to the lab and um, then referred her to the uvi -dis clinic and just put, continued her on the Diamox for the time being. She came back to neuro-ophthalmology a month later before she had a chance to be seen in uvi -dis because she had some worsened blurry vision and her stiff neck had kind of returned. Uh, the laboratory workup that I mentioned, it was all within normal limits. The only abnormal thing was that she had some EBV titers that were showing evidence of prior infection. Um, and then the exam was unchanged except for a rare vitreous cell and then some fullness of the optic nerves but no edema. It actually improved a little bit. So I had a repeat OCT at that time and showed kind of the same thing, this macular star that shows up really well right here and then that same ISOS disruption and photoreceptor loss and then some exudates. And then the, o, or the left eye was similar to what we had already talked about before. So continued on the Diamox, we did, or there was a discussion, keep on saying we, I wasn't here at that time, but there was a discussion with infectious disease and about this, this EBV titer, and they, just, they had recommended, well, why don't you go ahead and repeat the LP and check for an EBV, EBV PCR? Um, and so that was planned. She then, you know, a few months later, ended up in uveitis for follow-up. That repeat lumbar puncture showed that the EBV PCR was, was negative. It was just consistent with previous exposure. And then she had a normal opening pressure at that time and a normal cell count. Her vision still seemed blurry. And then her baseline vision exam was really unchanged. Okay, some more pictures here. So you can see that partial macular star nasally, just a little bit right there, but otherwise really normal. And then no evidence macular star there. So things had even improved on her dilated exam. She had a fundus autofluorescence, which was normal in both eyes. And then she did undergo an FA, of course, right? Oh, I know Rebecca went. And she had a normal arm to eye and AV transit. But she did have some um, patchy choroidal filling, which I, I feel like was illustrated well in this snapshot. And then uh, along the superior arcade, she had some of these punctate hyperfluorescence areas that you can see right here. And then finally, just some very mild staining of the optic nerves. But nothing to, nothing to write home about. So, otherwise, there was no leakage in the parafovial capillary network, no leakage or staining of the retinal vessels, and the left eye was otherwise within normal limits as well. Uh, had uveitis follow up two months later. Her vision was uh, normal. Her she still had some mild blurriness, but that was it. And then the remainder of her exam was really unchanged including they repeat an OCT, a fundus autofluorescence, a visual field. And then she did undergo a multifocal ERG, which was with the normal limits in both eyes as well. She had had a couple follow-ups over the next six months, but they were normal, and then she subsequently lost a follow-up. Until, so five years later, so this last July, she showed up again in her ophthalmology clinic with complaints of five days of blurry vision in her left eye, as well as pain with eye movements. I've just kind of marked the, like I said, the notable findings here. So a decreased visual acuity in the left eye. She had a trace APD in the left eye. And then her color vision was also decreased in that same eye. Um, really the only notable thing on the lab or dilated exam is she had some just irregularity with those pigmentary changes, which you can imagine as we looked at were kind of the remainder or the, the remaining findings from the macular star. She did have a fundus, or excuse me, a Humphrey visual field done again, a 30 2. And in her left eye, there, so there were quite a few fixation losses. I don't know if you can see that, but 5 out of 15. But still, obviously, she has a, a new deficit here in the left eye. OCT was repeated and just showed evidence of those pigmentary changes from the macular star, the same ISOS disruption photoreceptor loss. And the left eye was pretty unchanged. She did have an MRI. Um, which showed enhancement of the left optic nerve. Sorry. Right here. Um, that you can also see pretty well in coronal section right here. Suggestive of an optic neuritis. And then her. <laughs> sorry, I don't know what, what I'm doing here. Yeah. Uh, and then on her brain, uh, image, MRI imaging, she also had a, a T2 flare white matter lesion uh, right here, concerning for multiple sclerosis. So she's diagnosed with optic neuritis. There was concern for multiple sclerosis. So she had, um, she received, she was admitted to the hospital, received IV solumedrol uh, for the three days, and then was started on a prednisone taper. 
Um, symptoms had improved and completely resolved by the end of that steroid taper. And the only real update to her medical history in that time was she had um, she'd served an LDS mission, so she's living in central Mexico for 18 months. And then she, over that period of time, she gained about 15 pounds, but still was, her BMI was within normal limits. She came back three months later, uh, and her symptoms had resolved. Vision was normal. Her, she just had that small APD in the left eye still. But she had this stage two optic disc edema in both eyes, even though her visual uh, function was intact. So given this history of optic neuritis, neuroretinitis, demyelinating lesions on MRI, and then now she has this bilateral painless disc edema with preserved visual function, um, really the differential diagnosis, uh, in fact, Dr. Warner had, had in the room had said, hey, you know, what do you think? I, I had no idea, and it was a, <laughs> just highly embarrassing. And so I looked it up and uh, looked at all these MS mimickers, and it really it's quite a broad differential. Um, and I looked up several papers in preparation for this talk, which I'll go over later, and there's, there's, there is quite an extensive differential. Um, but we also had to consider diagnoses that included more than one uh, entity. Uh, in her case, so thank you, Dr. Hickam. We ordered uh, the lab workup shown there, and then she had already had an MRI C and T spine planned, uh, a CTV to check for uh, venous sinus thrombosis. Her LP did show uh, elevation of opening pressure at 26, and then she also had oligoclonal bands. Otherwise, her help or her CSF studies were normal. Um, oops, sorry. And then really her exam at that point had um, returned to normal. So a final diagnosis, and just kind of cut into the chase so I can get into uh, kind of what I, I, I hope is a learning point for uh, my, my talk here, is that she, we, she had a diagnosis of multiple sclerosis um, based on the imaging findings and her symptoms, but then she also had you know, symptoms suggestive of idiopathic intracranial hypertension. Um, but what about the neur neuroretinitis? So it was something that we just couldn't quite fit everything in a one nice neat box. But it fits a little better than maybe I thought quite at first. Um, so looking back, there are several papers that have a nice uh, review of um, you know, a differential diagnosis for optic disc edema with a macular star. And on each of them, so papilledema is one of the things that needs to be considered. So it is known that papilledema can cause uh, a macular star. And Particularly when it is papilledema, then they tend to be bilateral, and then there are other, obviously, other signs and symptoms of increased intracranial pressure. Also, it should be known that idiopathic is uh, like it's the most common, you know, diagnosis of of neuroretinitis or disc swelling with associated macular star. And then again, like I said, papilledema is always mentioned. But you do, of course, need to rule out other possible. Uh, etiologies, especially infectious causes that need to be treated uh, immediately. So while parsimony is nice, uh, we do need to keep our differential broad. This is, I just thought this was an interesting paper that um, DR had, had mentioned to me as we were discussing this case that, you know, back in 1987 there was this study done uh, by a group where they, they followed about 50 patients, or rather they followed 10 and then there was a retrospective review of 40 patients that had uh, developed neuroretinitis and at some point had developed a uh, macular star. And their, their hope was to say, well, if people do develop a neuroretinitis, is this something we can look at to say they're very unlikely to develop MS in the future? And their findings, based on these 50 patients that they either followed prospectively or retrospectively, actually did. I mean, what they said is such a star, a macular star, and as present suggests papillitis, a vascular cause, and militates strongly against the subsequent develop, development of mac, or multiple sclerosis. So this was, you know, something that had been published, it had been vetted, and, and presumably was of the thought process, you know, at that time. But since then, there have been several studies. I just picked out a couple um, where they've done studies and followed people prospectively again that have uh, developed multiple sclerosis and either looked back and seen if they've had a macular star or vice versa, followed people that have had macular star and followed them prospectively. There's actually quite high percentages of people that do. So just in this particular study that I pulled, uh, of three of 35 patients, so not a big you know, cohort, but uh, a, a large percentage of this particular group that had a macular star but still went on to develop uh, um, multiple sclerosis. So important to keep our minds open. Um, as I mentioned, uh, the differential diagnosis for mimics or chameleons of optoneuritis is really bright or broad, but the important thing and something that I think uh, 
or at least I, I hope to continue learning it, you know, especially in neuro-ophthalmology clinic, is just the importance of taking a really good history, because this is so broad, but a lot of it can be narrowed down based off of that history. You get a clinical history where you can rule out several things and then don't have to throw every single lab test, every single, you know, uh, imaging test at the patient and can save them a lot of headache and expense and time. Um, but this is, these are just a few that I pulled out that uh, the list was actually much longer, but it would have taken several slides of just copying. So I just pulled out a few that I thought were interesting. So uh, I want to end there so we have plenty of time for the last presentation. But I, I think that the important thing to remember in, in all of medicine, you know, certainly ophthalmology isn't excluded in this, is that while we try and fit everything into a nice little parsimonious box as often as possible, that it doesn't always happen. Um, and that especially in, you know, I think that neuro-ophthalmology, uveitis, some of these um, other very complex uh, subspecialties, it's really important to remember this. And I really, I, I just like this quote, uh, that everything should be made as simple as possible, but, but not simpler. So to try and make everything make sense, but at the same time, keeping your mind open uh, to other possibilities that may include different diagnoses for one patient presenting with certain symptoms. I think that's it. Just as an update, um, uh, this patient has followed up with her in neuro ophthalmology clinic since that time, and has, uh, the last visit she had has been uh, just, she's been doing okay, hasn't had any visual complaints, so she's doing well at this point. But take any questions or are happy to entertain any comments?